just to repeat what we were talking last time, uh, we are trying to make directional antennas. That's what uh, the early experimenters with radio waves didn't know. Well, in fact, uh, Heinrich Hertz has used uh, parabolic mirrors, but uh, uh, he was using this, he borrowed this idea from the optics. Uh, but he could not really, did not really do much. And people that worked after, uh, after Heinrich Hertz worked uh, at much lower frequencies because the efficiency of the equipment was better at lower frequencies. And uh, they didn't know how to make directional antennas. Really speaking. It is only 20 or 30 years later, so in 1920, that other antenna designs appear. So one of the first design was to build a horn. A horn that opens slowly. So that hopefully our wave fronts, which were straight here in the wave height section, do not accumulate much phase error here. They, in fact, they do spread out into a conical shape or pyramidal shape, but uh, as long as we can control this phase error here, it's all okay. The problem here is where? Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, this uh, length of this horn. Uh, should, should I put a letter L here. L. And length should be, if we want the phase error to be neglect neglectingly small, uh, this phase error should be approximately the Rayleigh distance, so to D squared over lambda. And this is, if this is the aperture D of my horn. And uh, this is excessively large. So th this is completely unpractical. We saw with, for a television antenna last time that for an aperture of half a square meter, we need a, an antenna that is uh, 40 meters long. So it doesn't make sense. It's not, it's, it works, but it is not a practical solution to do this thing. So uh, the next idea was to use a steeper horn, an open horn that opens steeply, that has a significant phase error here. Uh, which really gives low directivity. But we can correct with the dead of the, uh, the electric lens here. Uh, we could correct this phase error uh, to obtain uh, planar straight uh, wave fronts here. And last time we had a look at uh, such a solution. Uh, building artificial dielectrics. Now with artificial dielectrics we can make the lens any size we want. But to stay on the practical size, not on the theoretical size, on the practical size, these uh, this, uh, slow wave structures are usually just one dim dimension. So we make the lens as a one dimensional arrangement of, uh, of uh, metal rods. Here we have maybe the driven element, and here we have the reflector. Uh, but now, this is a uh, one-dimensional slow wave structure. With one-dimensional so slow wave structure, if you just build this, this, this in one dimension, uh, the directivity is limited. This limits the directivity, say, to around uh, uh, again, a practical value. It's not a theoretical value. Theoretical is unlimited, but practical value around 20 dBi. If it's just a single dimension. If it has three dimensions, like this lens here, then we are not limited. But uh, I think it is practical to build slow, the, the, uh, slow, slow wave structures as one dimension structures, because it's easy, it's simple, it's cheap. And uh, with one dimension structure, here the limit is around 20 dBi. Now the question is, can, can we do it in a different way here? Uh, how to do it in a different way? In a different way, could we use something else? And that something else may be again having a steep horn here. Yeah. 
with again wave fronts that are spherical now exiting out of the throat of the horn. And trying to use here a converging, converging mirror. So a properly shaped mirror. Properly shaped mirror. So that the reflection of the surface of this mirror, we get here straight wave fronts. So this is now a converging mirror. Now the first question to be solved is what is the required shape of this mirror? Well, what do we have to do? We have to try, uh, start from the face center of our antenna. Uh, we get spherical wave fronts from the face center of this antenna and we should get uh, planar, here planar waves in the far field, so we should have planar wave guys, so straight, planar wave fronts, so straight, uh, uh, straight, uh, straight, uh, uh, straight wave fronts after the mirror. And maybe we should we should look this detail, this in more detail. How do we do this? This is also a known issue from optics. Say, uh, good optical telescopes always use mirrors. The mirror is the shape. Uh, mirror is the shape that we can make the best one. We can also make a good shape of a lens, but the problem is the material of the lens. Uh, this is not just with slow wave structures, it's the same problem in optics. Uh, in optics, a lens, the material we build the lens from, its refraction index is a function of frequency. So this does not work broadband. While the mirror is always broadband because it reflects all waves all, all, of all different wavelengths in the same way. That's the reason why in optics, say in your camera, usually you do not have just a single lens, a single objective lens. You have more lenses built from different glass so that the refraction indices of different glasses, uh, the change of refraction indices of different glasses compensate each other to get, to get a good lens here for a good... Uh, good optical uh, telescope. While mirror telescopes do not, do not have these problems, and in fact, all good telescopes use mirrors to get the best shape. What should be the shape now of our mirror? Uh, I will draw here a coordinate system to start with. So this may be x-axis, y-axis may go inside my desk here. We don't need the third dimension really why, but I was just drawing to have three dimensions and I have axis z here. What I want to obtain is a planar wave fronts up here. And I want uh, this planar wave fronts to converge into a single focal point. With uh, my mirror having a certain shape to do this job. Now, what uh, I would like to calculate here is what should be the shape of the mirror. So this uh, z uh, is now a function of uh, x and y. What should be this function to have all, all different rays converging in the focal point. Okay, we have uh, one central ray. Uh, let's start our the calculations from the wave front that stays at the height h. So if I look at the central ray, this ray makes an h distance here and this uh, distance here is f, the focal point of our mirror. While uh, a side ray goes this way, so this is 
h minus z, where z is given here, the shape of our mirror. And further, we have this path here. And this path here, uh, we could calculate it with the, calculate this path with the Pythagora theorem, how long it is. So this is, this was f. Uh, so this length here is, if I take another color because the picture gets a little bit messy, I can calculate it from this uh, triangle. So this here is square root of x squared plus y squared. Just looking at the third dimension inside the table. And this section here is f minus z. If the whole length was f, f minus z is just this section here. So now you can write the equation. So the central ray travels the path h plus f. So h plus f is the central ray. Uh, this is equal on the other side. On the other side is this uh, this uh, line here, and this line here, the length of this line, is square root of what? Of f minus z squared plus this one squared plus x squared plus y squared. Okay? Uh, so, uh, the other part is uh, h minus z. Uh, plus this square root, this part here is the square root of uh, f minus z squared plus x squared plus y squared. Okay? So if the central ray travels the same distance as the side ray here, then this mirror actually works. And I'm trying to find now the uh, the shape of the surface of this mirror. This is a mirror here. Just to indicate we have a mirror. Oh, the first thing that happens here is that this h was actually an, at an arbitrary height. Take, uh, h taken at an arbitrary height above the plane x, y. But this height here uh, is arbitrary. We just took one of the wave fronts coming from infinity. So it should cancel out of our equation. In fact, it cancels out because it's on both sides. This and this cancels out. So we have uh, f plus z is equal on the other side square root of f minus z squared. This is this section here uh, plus x squared plus y squared, OK? Uh, how to solve this equation? We have to square it now to get rid of the square root. So uh, f plus z squared is equal to, is equal to f minus z squared plus x squared plus y squared, OK? Uh, we have to calculate the squares. So calculating the squares is this square here is now f squared plus 2fz plus uh, z squared. So this thing here. On the other side, we have f squared minus f2fz plus z squared uh, plus x squared plus y squared. Also here we have many simplifications to be done. Uh, we could cancel out this f squared here. Cancels out because it's on both sides of the equation. And also what we could cancel out is this z squared. z squared also is on both sides of the equation. So we have the result now. 4 times fz is equal to x squared plus y squared, or uh, our function z, the function for the, the function of what we were looking for, 
Now z is equal to x squared plus y squared divided by 4 times f. So this is the shape of our mirror, the shape we need for our mirror. We have the shape of our mirror here. Uh, and what is we got here? This is a rotational paraboloid. So we take uh, a parabola in two dimension and we rotate that parabola around the axis z to get this uh, three dimensional shape. Uh, what happens now? So if I try, try to make a drawing here, because this is already messy, so I will try to draw it another time here. So this is z. Uh, we have the y-axis going inside the table, the, 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 the screen and uh, x-axis here. So this shape is actually First, we start with a parabola. Hope to make a nice drawing. And this is rotated. So this is now uh, rotationally symmetric. So it's rotated <coughs> around here. Hope it's clear what, what, what I mean here. So it's uh, rotationally symmetric. Uh, okay, we got the shape. Very, very simple, uh, very simple derivation. Very old, also, several hundred years old from optical telescopes. Uh, now, uh, what are we required to do? A uh, rotational paraboloid is an infinite surface. It's infinitely large. Now, our question is. How much uh, we cannot make the whole paraboloid because it's infinitely large. It doesn't make sense. We make just the part a cut out of this paraboloid. We make, and we take its focal point say, here. The paraboloid has its focal point. Calculated the paraboloid. What do we want to make now out of this paraboloid? Well, one possibility is to make a rotationally symmetrical cutout. So like this one here, this one here could be rotationally symmetric. And down this area here, also this part here. So our paraboloid is actually this part. And it's on the other side. It also goes here. This is also the shape we have. But this is on the back, so I have to draw it in a different way. I hope it's clear what to do. So we have a symmetric cutout. We usually call it a dish, this, because it's a form of a dish. Uh, with the same focal point, we can also make different cutouts, not just this one here. We could make a, make a cutout. I'm going to use now a different color here just, just to show it. We could make here a side cutout, say like here. I'm trying to use color to, to show you what do I mean. So this side cutout here is an offset dish. Uh, both can be used. Uh, both uh, have uh, each each of them has some advantages and some disadvantages. So uh, it's not that one is better than the other. <coughs> uh, so we have symmetric dishes and offset dishes. What do we do now out of these dishes? Uh, let's have a look first at the symmetric dish. So if I draw a symmetric dish, uh, so this is 
now it's axis. Like a sort of symmetric dish. What can we learn about the geometry? The dish is usually described by its par uh, diameter. And is also described by its depth here. The depth here is h. Uh, this h has no relationship with this h here. So uh, just this is just the height of the dish. This was an arbitrary height above our antenna. Uh, we don't know anything about its focal. Where the focal point of this dish is. Of course, it lies on the uh, axis of rotation. But uh, uh, what can we learn out of this if we take the equation here? So h, I could also draw this h here. So h is equal to x squared plus y squared at the edge of our dish. This is d half squared divided by 4 times the focal length of this dish. So if, if I rewrite this, this is d squared divided by 16 times the focal length. Or if I invert the formula, if I have such a symmetric dish, how do I obtain its, its focal? The focal point of this dish is now uh, diameter of the dish squared divided by 16 times the depth of the dish. This is quite useful. We found a strange dish. We don't know anything about it. We can calculate its focal point. Uh, now, uh, <coughs> we can calculate its focal point, and we know where to put actually the face center of our feet. It's not is not uh, the same point always. It's, it's the precisely defined point of the feet. And we, for this reason, we need to know the face center of our feet to put the face center exactly in our dish. Say if this was a feet horn here. Put the focal point exactly in the face center here to have everything working. I will continue with the symmetric dish because it's actually easy, easy to understand how it works. Later we are going to see the offset dish, what are the advantages of the offset dish. So yet another uh, important parameter of the dish is its depth. How deep is the dish? We could make this dish quite shallow or we could make it very deep. So. Uh, the important parameter now is the f to d ratio. This parameter tells how deep is our dish. The larger this parameter, f to d, the flatter the dish, the shallower the dish. So this uh, f to d parameter is uh, the larger it is, the shallower is the dish. What do we know about the f to d ratio? It is also used in optics, not just in uh, radio communication. So, uh, in uh, uh, what do we know about F to D? F to D, it starts around two. Uh, let's let me say, I will use the figures that are printed on a camera, 1.8 uh, for a photographic camera. If it has a good lens, it's 1.8. If it's a worse camera, this thing may go all the way up to 3, perhaps up to 9, depending on um, the diameter of the lens we are actually using. But it's also something applicable to cameras. And you have this if you have a manual camera, not an automatic one. It's depicted on the settings of the objective lens of your, your camera. It, it is also on digital cameras, now they are all automatic, all digital. It is uh, printed on the picture. This was the data of the picture, how it was taken. Uh, if this thing is uh, between 0.3 and 0.4, very small, 
This is usually used for symmetric radio dishes. And offset dishes, offset dishes usually have a larger, uh, a larger f to d ratio, have this f to d ratio uh, between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7. This is usually for offset, uses for the offset dishes. Of course, radio dish. I'm not in the printing radio. But uh, just to make a connection between optics and radio, so in radio, we are trying to use shorter focal lengths. What is the reason here? Uh, the reason to use shorter focal lengths is to have a wider angle here. Wider angle here, so this is alpha, and this is also alpha on this side here. To have wider angles, because if we were using dishes, very shallow dishes as used as used for lenses in photography, we would require quite a substantial gain from the feed horn. And if we have gain from the feed horn, this feed horn actually, the larger the feed horn, the larger the shade on the dish. All the shade the feed horn does, so if this is my dish and this is the feed horn. Okay. This fit horn actually illuminates the dish. Here it is coming out. But uh, this fit horn also makes a shade here. If we had a, a very high gain uh, fit horn, this fit horn would be had a large aperture. A larger aperture means, means a larger shade here, so all this surface here of the dish is lost. All this, is, all this surface here is actually lost because uh, the, feed, the feed of the dish actually blocks uh, this surface. So what does that mean? With uh, very deep dishes, we can get along with uh, this feed horn that has perhaps uh, 7 dBi of directivity. For the shallower offset dishes, we have a directivity of a feed horn of perhaps uh, 12 dBi. Where is the reason here? Uh, for shallower dishes, uh, I will write now, uh, we draw just the parabol shape of the paraboloid. Now its uh, axis is here. And uh, what I practically make for this dish is just a section, an offset section. So this section here, uh, this, this is practically made, the rest is just mathematical theory. We made practically here an offset dish. Where is the trick right now? The trick is that I put the feed here. And this feed now illuminates the dish. And you see what happens? There is no shade of the feet. Since uh, we only made that part of the dish that does not lie in the position of the field, so this field does not interact with the reflected wave of the mirror. And there is no shade. There is no shade in this. So from this point of view, the offset uh, dish should be better than the, uh, than the symmetrical dish. But there are problems. There are problems. First, we need a lar uh, larger focal, a larger focal length. And we need a larger feed. And mechanically, something that is rotationally symmetric, it can simply be turned on simple machinery. While making uh, an offset dish of the exact 
uh, surface is much more difficult. So this is much more difficult to make than this one here. Both are useful. This has no shade of the feet, but it requires a larger feet with a larger gain. And uh, uh, well, this one requires a smaller feet. So each one has uh, its own uh, advantage here. Uh, what can we say about this feet? So if this dish were operating like this one here, this is uh, uh, um, perfect illumination. But this does not happen in practice. In practice, we have feeds that are even broader or narrower. Yeah. Emit even broader or narrower radiation. So we may have a feed that, uh, for the same dish, that this feed only illuminates part of this dish. So this is the illuminated area here. This was the illuminated area here. There is still a feed shade, of course, but uh, this is an under-illuminated dish. Now, with uh, the under-illuminated dish, where is the question now? The question is, what is the purpose of this uh, dish that was not illuminated? It has no purpose. If there is no radio, uh, there are no radio waves there, we just lost metal there. We just have a huge uh, piece of metal that has no electrical purpose. On the other hand, we may have an over-illuminated dish. We have a feed that now uh, uh, emits radiation well over the outer rim of the dish. Of course, now, some of this radiation is lost here, and the other part of this radiation proceeds forward. So this is an over-illuminated. And we have some spillover. Also, in the case of the spillover, we don't cannot get the maximum gain out of this dish. Why not? Because we lose some of the power of our transmitter in this spillover. On the receiving side, okay, we collect all the power from this dish with this horn, but part of this power is reflected out to the spillover lobes, uh, so to, to the spillover direction, the direction of the spillover. So in, also in the, the receiving, here uh, in the receiving conditions, here we are in rec while receiving, we are not using the whole surface of the dish. Here, while receiving, we are uh, part of this radiation that's collected by the dish. All of it is focused to the feed horn. But the feed horn has a broader pattern, and part of it is not, does not go to the electrical circuit, but is radiated back into free space uh, uh, around, uh, through this spillover around the area. So this is not a good solution. This is not a good solution. Uh, both uh, this degrade the illumination efficiency. So here the illumination efficiency goes down. And here the illumination efficiency also goes down. If we have spillover, it goes down. It goes down when we have uh, uh, under illumination of the dish. And of course, also the feed shade is also it's our illumination efficiency. Also this is. So we have many, many problems now with the dish. Uh, we have feed shade, we have uh, uh, under illumination or over, over illumination, especially if you think that uh, a real world fit harm or any other antenna, no, I'm just drawing the fit harm because it's simplest to draw. This thing actually does not have a conical radiation pattern. 
This thing has something like this. This is a real world antenna. So where to take which point do where how do you adjust this kind of radiation pattern to a real world dish? Uh, yes, there's a trick about how to do it. If we want to have the maximum uh, radiation efficiency. So this also means maximum directivity of the whole antenna. Okay. Then the general rule is to have the feed horn selected so that uh, its radiation at the edge of the dish compared to the central part, central radiation goes here. If this is 0 dB, the center, we have around, uh, around minus 10 dB illumination. I have no mathematical proof for this, but this minus 10 dB, where does it come from? Uh, if I draw here the radiation pattern, uh, usually this is around minus 6 dB to minus 7 dB, uh, the, uh, uh, the radiation pattern of our dish, uh, of our horn at the edge of the dish. And we have yet another, uh, you see that this distance is shorter than this one here. So uh, longer distance, larger distance. We have at the larger distance, we have about minus 3 dB to minus 4 dB. This is just from the practical side how to design an antenna. So if you have a fit horn that you know its radiation pattern, uh, it should be correct uh, to assume that you have minus 10 dB at the edge of uh, your symmetrical dish. It's also for the offset dish also the calculation is similar. Uh, so this is a, a more practical rule. This minus 10 dB at the edge of the dish is a practical rule how to illuminate the dish. It is not uh, the same if we are optimizing something else. Not uh, here, not the... Uh, this was for the maximum radiation efficiency. Uh, illumin sorry, maximum illumination efficiency uh, or maximum directivity to get the maximum directivity out, out of our dish. But we may have other requests. Uh, frequently in a communication, we are trying to optimize the signal to noise ratio. Power of the, our signal divided by power of our noise. And our signal here is uh, proportional to <coughs> proportional to the gain of our antenna, and the noise is proportional to what? The noise is proportional to the Boltzmann constant times the sum of temperature temperature of the antenna and plus temperature of the uh, receiver. Uh, we are going to discuss the antenna temperature later on in another lecture. We cannot do everything today, but I have to combine somewhat uh, into a single lecture. We, we are going to discuss this thing further on. So uh, what is our optimization? We want to maximize the G over T ratio, gain over temperature. Gain over temperature, and this is actually the gain of our antenna, or we could write the directivity times efficiency, but efficiency of these antennas is almost, almost one. So it's just free space in between, and uh, uh, metals, any kind of metal at radio frequencies is good, divided by 
the temperature of our antenna plus temperature of the receiver. What is now, where is now the problem? The problem is that this spillover usually looks at the warm earth, warm soil. That's perhaps 300 Kelvin. Well, if we have a, a, a temperature here. Well, this thing is, say, for space communication, and this thing may look up into space, so uh, cold sky. Cold sky may have just a temperature of 10 Kelvin. So in the case of satellite communication, this spillover is very, very disturbing because it adds all, lots of noise to our equation. Receivers can be made quite low noise to today technology. Uh, uh, well, uh, if we are receiving, usually we need good antennas to receive uh, uh, transmitters f far away, say far away in space, and space is usually quite cold, except for some hot spots like the sun. But otherwise space is very cold, so we want to prevent spillover at all costs. In order to prevent spillover, what do we do with our antenna? If we optimize is for the maximum g over t, if we have here our fit horn, we slightly under illuminate our dish. Just slightly, not much, but just slightly. So that uh, at the edge, we still have some signal at the edge, but this signal as the edge is uh, the edge illumination. So we have between minus 15 dB and we have, we have a very good receiver up to minus 20 dB of illumination, of edge illumination. So for high performance space communications, uh, we are going to use a fit horn that Yes, it still has some spillover, but this spillover is much smaller than for maximum D. We are not, we do not uh, look for the maximum D, we look for the maximum G over T. And that's the reason why we use a much, much weaker edge illumination. Uh, if I try to make a drawing, but I have to find some space. What is now the trade-off here? If we make a drawing. If we draw here the uh, angle alpha under which we see the dish, or uh, in other words, if I draw here uh, uh, f over d, but uh, to the minus one, the minus r, r. Where do we have our curve? We have the curve of the gain. It goes this way. Okay, this is gain. Directivity or gain. But, uh, okay, we write here directivity or gain. It's almost the same because the efficiency of the addition antenna is good. But if we look at the temperature here, so the sum of all temperatures, the sum of all temperatures, here we see the cold sky. And then this thing starts growing up, up, uh, af and after uh, after making the feed very very broad, we receive all the 300 Kelvin from the soil. So this is actually the sum of the temperatures. You see that this curve divided by this curve does not have the maximum here. The maximum is shifted further down. So the g over t. Yes, it is something like this one. Mm -hmm. 
And this is, uh, so this curve is for minus 10 dB. Illumination of the edge, this maximum here. And this maximum here is around minus 20 dB. If we have very good receivers, and receivers are becoming quite good, so uh, we should really consider this figure 20 dB. 15 dB was 30 years ago. 20 dB is right now with very good, uh, very good, uh, uh, very low noise receivers we can make right now. Right now. So we could make this thing, uh, th things much further down, uh, much further down to get the best G over T. We are actually inter interested in the G over T for the maximum signal to noise ratio. We are not interested in the maximum gain. This is of course for receiving. For transmitting, we are following this one here. For transmitting, we just want our uh, our correspondent to get the, uh, the maximum possible signal. And then we uh, use, uh, use the maximum reactivity, maximum uh, illumination efficiency of the dish. Uh, uh, there is yet another story here I didn't tell. Today we have many radio communications on many frequencies. We should also care about interference, and the interference may also happen in the transmitting antenna. We may radiate interference in the, in the unwanted directions. We can receive interference from unwanted directions. So this edge under illumination here, I will write here under illumination. We actually have uh, under illuminated dish here. Uh, we actually uh, use, frequently use this also in terrestrial communication. Uh, if the spectrum, frequency spectrum is quite crowded, so uh, in order to avoid interference, we prefer to under illuminate our dish and also take other countermeasures. Uh, something that we didn't talk about is that this feed here, it's not just the feed shape is also the support structure of this feed. So there should be supports extending over the dish and they also cause a shade. So uh, not just that they cause the shade, but they cause side lobes and side lobes collect interference or radiate interference. So that is a problem. So this is for this hour. Let's see next hour. How are we going? Uh, next hour we are going to discuss how are we going to make feeds from uh, simple feeds like this one here Two more complicated feed, feed, uh, feed horns uh, for antennas. But this we're going to discuss this the other the next hour. Okay.